Um, what a pleasure to be here. Um, so my talk is about the challenges for faculty of implementing service learning and what needs to happen to support faculty in adopting service learning in their practice. So I mentioned to Sandy that I would start by explaining what service learning is for, for those who want a refresher or who've come because, because you're curious. But let me first ask you um, how many, like I would like to know the question about who's, who's in the box and it's unfortunate that, that sort of, we all like to think of ourselves as thinking outside of the box, but um, <laughs> maybe I'll put my question this way. Um, how many of you are faculty who are already practicing service learning? And how many of you are faculty who are curious about service learning or who perhaps in implement a few service learning elements in your teaching? And how many are staff who support service learning? Okay, that, that, that helps me. So this is a service learning wise group, but it, it never hurts to refresh our thinking about what service learning is. It's always useful for me to think about it. The, the easiest way I uh, can explain it is that service learning is simple, simply the combining of formal academic study with activities that take place outside the classroom. So in other words, service learning is experiential learning, and yet service learning is more than experiential learning. Service learning practitioners distinguish this service learning from ex the broader category of experiential learning by mm, identifying ways that service learning is in the service of the public good or the common good. Could be in the service of, of individuals, of, of organizations or agencies, of communities, or, or just more broadly in the servic service of um, civic education or other kinds of community um, uh, community enhancement or community good. So that said, service learning can take a range of forms, projects, placements, charitable good works, more activist orientations to service learning, and also service learning for, for social justice. Um, and we can get into this in our roundtable conversations, and I'm sure other speakers will, will address this. <coughs> So I came to embrace service learning for two reasons, um, pedagogical and principled. The pedagogical reason is that I think service learning is an effective pedagogy. It's a great way for uh, students to learn in a way that is connected, relevant, and complex. My principled reason doesn't have to do so much with social justice, although I identify with that term, but because I see universities as well-resourced institutions, and I, I think universities need to open themselves to avoid insularity and to share the resources. So the ivory tower to the public square idea, and service learning can facilitate that, and that's consistent with what, what Anna was saying. But I came to service learning only very gradually and I want to mainly talk about what I see as the impediments or obstacles or limitations to faculty adopting service learning. Now, I didn't bring any slides, and so I'm going to ask everyone just to, um, to visualize something for me as though it was on my slide. If you could all just visualize a quadrilateral, quadrilateral shape, so a four-sided shape. Maybe it's a rhombus or a diamond. And think of this shape, the four sides of the shape, as representing the four constituents that have to be connected for service learning to work. And those four constituents would be interested students, supportive staff, willing community partners, and then enthusiastic faculty. So if you're visualizing your shape. I would argue that in the shaping of service learning, it's the enthusiastic faculty that are often missing. And it's the, the absence of that, of that one side of the diamond that prevents, prevents service learning to, um, like, okay, continuing to crystallize, <laughs> to continue the metaphor. 
so this was reinforced for me a couple of years ago when I was in Gail Cook's position as the faculty associate for service learning. And in the first month of my position, I had appointments with three people who are all staff from different um, uh, different units, different faculties from education, one from science and one from international services and they, they came to me and said they had a great idea for service learning and could I help them. They, um, they all had day-to-day -day administrative responsibility for their new programs in their units. And they had ideas about how service learning would fit with the curriculum, with the learning outcomes, with community service and community partners that they'd identified. And I said, that sounds amazing. So who are the faculty champions in your unit that could, that could take this on, that could deliver service learning, that could develop it? No answer, no answer. They couldn't identify faculty who, who could make that happen. So, I d this isn't something I just came to kind of lament, but I'd like to analyze why, why that might be the case, that I think faculty might be the, the, the missing piece, so that we can best think through how to support faculty in taking on service learning. So there are three things that, I've, that I can see that, that are challenges. Even though faculty obviously have the best job on the planet, it's not a job that's without, without stress, and faculty are without their, um, say, stress or neuroses that are related to the complexity of, of the work that we do. So I'll explain it this way. 40-40-20 is one of the rules that faculty, the shape faculties work. 40-40-20, if it referred to just, you know, one's ideal balance of carbs, protein, and fat in a healthy diet would be really easy to follow. But 40-40-20, of course, is the, the dis distribution of our workload between teaching, research, and administration. And it's hard because any of those components of a faculty job could be a full job in itself. And so faculty are always under time stress. 40-40-20 is only loosely enforced but it's a second condition, structural condition of a faculty member's job that makes 40-40-20 even more um, difficult to, um, to live with, and that is um, peer review. Our work is evaluated by people we know and people we don't know in ways that have major consequences for our advancement. And the work that is evaluated most is our research. So there's 40-40-20 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, um, peer review and also our academic reputations that, that put pressure on faculty. We care about academic reputation not just because we may be hyper competitive or we may be um, suffering from statics anxiety. Really, um, academic reputation is so important to faculty because we see ourselves as responsible for maintaining the standards of our disciplines and our practices. And so that applies, again, to research as much as to teaching. So taking to, taken together, these three conditions and motivations, I think work against the adoption of service learning in our teaching and account for why faculty may be reluctant to take up service learning in, um, in a really sustained uh, way, and also why we prefer in teaching, we tend to prefer to fall back to lecturing, which research tells us is not the most effective way to, to teach. Lecturing takes less time, especially year after year. Lecturing reinforces the faculty member's um, um, centrality, I'll say centrality, and our, um, our connection to the, uh, the course material. And then lecturing also allows faculty to absolutely control the content of teaching and what, what we deliver and the teaching environment. Whereas service learning takes time, is messy, and the learning environment is a chaotic one. Okay, so what can be done then 
given, given these circumstances to draw more faculty to service learning. I would make a couple of recommendations. My main advice would be to make service learning scholarly. And at Brock, we've, had, we've made a good start in doing this institutionally, which is by administratively locating support for service learning within the Center for Pedagogical Innovation, within an academic unit. I think that's really important. And also, we've made a great start at Brock in attaching research programs to service learning wherever possible through service learning incentives grants, through the Chancellor's Chair for Teaching Excellence, which has often supported service learning projects. But we also can go further in recognizing service learning as a valuable, a valued practice in teaching, uh, in tenure and promotion. In other words, recognizing service learning as the scholarship of, of education community-engaged scholarship. So the second way that I think um, we can encourage faculty to take up service learning, make it scholarly, and secondly, make uh, the adoption of service learning possible to do incrementally. And I think we'll, get, we'll all get ideas for, for that uh, today by looking at reflective practice, by learning about the resources at Brock for uh, taking up service learning, but there are lots of ways that service learning can be built on through introducing experiential learning, active learning, field trips, guest speakers who are practitioners. All of these things can eventually, over time, result in a service learning, a full-blown service learning component, or even a course. So in our breakup groups, I would be very happy to hear your thoughts on the limitations and potentials for faculty in taking up service learning, because I think it is ultimately a gem of a pedagogy. So I look forward to talking to you about it more.